pre presenting this paper called Generating Compiler Optimizations from Proofs. Um, so there's kind of two ways I can present this. I, uh, one involves math, so I'll, and another one doesn't, but it's like really short <laughs> and doesn't really explain things. So I'll try and do that one first and then see what happens after that. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about the main like problem that we want to solve. So given an optimization that compilers do is given a certain program, uh, you transform to another program which hopefully does the same thing as the first one, uh, but presumably runs faster. So the way the way com the way optimizations are implemented in compilers, uh, people hand code the kind of optimizations that you can use and then just throw them in. So, um, so this paper has quite an interesting idea. Is that um, given given uh, the original program, uh, so any pro any program that's to be optimized, uh, the final output of the program the optimized program and a proof that both are equivalent, you can actually derive the most general optimization from uh, these things. Yeah. So in a in an automatic way, but without doing math it won't look very automatic. But yeah. <laughs> uh, so so the so let's just uh, let me just clarify what a proof of equivalence should look like. So let's have our fake programming language which looks which has like plus and minus and numbers. So um, here here is a program in our language. So um, we can what we can do is that we can note that uh, we use this axiom like x minus x equals zero. Um, we apply it here, and then we get 8 plus 0. And after this, uh, we can apply like identity for addition. So that would be um, if y equals 0 and x plus y, then x plus y is equal to x. Um, this is, um, it's a bit weird how I wrote it, but like, it's a bit hard to explain <laughs> why it's like that. <laughs> but yeah. Just bear with me for a while. So, um, so we have our original program on this side and an optimized version, which does the same thing as the original. And so we would like to we would like to derive a most general optimization based on this proof of equivalence. So, um, a naive way to do this is to just replace like equals by equals. So like eight become so in that manner you will get x plus x minus x goes to x as your optimization. But this isn't really the most general optimization because there's nothing uh forcing this x and this x to be the same thing. So the most general optimization is in fact x plus y minus y goes to x. So um to give like the intuition of why this is actually possible is because um, given a proof, like um, let's say we are given a proof um, that maybe it's written by a human or generated in some way. Um, a proof usually encompasses like uh, what is important about the, the transformation. It doesn't, like this proof, uh, doesn't use the fact that this x was the same as this one. So um, we, the proof actually co itself contains enough information to derive this generalized optimization. So um, the, the the key idea behind this is to uh, s is to start from the end and somehow apply the proof rules backwards and in the mean, and while applying them backwards, you kind of uh, mess with the thing such that everything lines up. <laughs> yeah, that's um, so. Let's say you had something like 
let's say you started from this thing, like a generalized form of it would be like, um, I don't know, some variable p or something. Uh, and then you want to kind of go backwards applying this rule. So uh, you want this side to look like 8 plus 0. So uh, you, you, need to, uh, you need to have some Q and you replace this thing with Q here. So I'm like trying, it's, it's a bit hard to explain, but uh, you, re you replace the P with, so we had one substitution, which was P goes to Q plus zero. Um, Is it basically some kind of it's, It looks like unification, but like it's a bit more complica complicated than that. Um, yeah. Pattern matching is kind of the along the right idea, I think. Yeah. It's like an unfolding? Unfolding. It's like you take a program and you generate like bigger programs and then you start. Maybe. I'm not very sure about that. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so you have kind of like. Okay. So like following this axiom, so you actually have Q plus R. You have like two um, things that you will need to show, which is Q plus R and equals Q. You have Q plus R and you have, you also want to show that R equals zero. And for that you use this, you apply this axiom backwards and then you get um, something like, uh, you can substitute R for like S minus S and then you finally get Q plus S minus S and then everything works out in the end. So like that's basically it. So I'm done. No. <laughs> uh, so um, let me go and talk about some possible applications of this idea. So um, the most obvious one the most obvious one, of course, is to uh, give an uh, instance of a program and the optimized version, and then uh, give the proof that the two are equal, like, for example, by hand. And then you could actually like, teach compilers optimizations without actually writing the code for the optimizations. Yeah. Um, another, another, another application that they came up with was, um, suppose you had a super compiler. Uh, a super a super optimizer don't know what you would call it yeah which basically like does a lot of analyses which are very time consuming uh, to optimize the program as much as possible so what you could do is you give you you give your su your super optimizer the original program you tell it to optimize it to something simpler and then after that you apply the generalization and you get something of this form, and then uh, instead, and now instead of doing uh, whatever uh, analysis it did here, you can just do a pattern matching on your program, and it just becomes like a single rewriting from one to the other, which comes a lot faster. Um, and also because like this algorithm was actually designed in very abstract terms. So you, could, you can actually apply these, these ideas to uh, areas such as like database local optimizations uh, where you kind of generalize relations between columns in some way. Or they could also do, um, you could also do improve uh, type checking errors in languages like maybe Haskell or something uh, uh, because um, like type checking, if you have a type checking error, it says that uh, this expression should be of this type. Uh, then you could take the you could take the the statement at the end, which is like uh, expression E should have type X, and then you you basically use this to ask like why should expression E have type X, and 
uh, when you generalize something, you remove everything that's unnecessary. So this simplifies the error message uh, to tell you like only the parts where uh, which forces the thing to be of a certain type. Yeah. Okay. So um, that's actually all I have for the <laughs> for the the no math part basically. So I'm <laughs> I'm not sure <laughs> I'm not sure if I should. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, because uh, I I might bore a lot of people. But <laughs> so, so w yeah. With this, wouldn't it generate like a lot of rules if the problem is large? Uh, the idea is you only do one optimization at a time. Oh. Yeah. But you provide like a short program and then you generate generalized this. As in, it gener it generates a generalized version of optimization. There's only one. Yeah. The more. Okay. Yeah. So it's not like you generate many different <coughs> programs. Yeah. What? So you do you, f you feed in the one on the left, right? The this, one. this one. This one. Yeah. And do you have to feed in the axioms? Uh, yes, you will also need some <coughs> set of axioms right. and the proof itself. So then on the then you <coughs> will return you the, com the optimized one on the right. Uh, no. So uh, you what you give is uh, this thing, the unoptimized version, the unoptimized instance, the optimized instance. Uh, the proof of equivalence, and then it will generate the general, the general instance. Okay. Yeah. You have to feed it intermediate states. Sorry. Um, you have to feed intermediate states. Yes, because that's you need all the steps of the proof. Yeah. So that means you have to give in, yeah. give in the optimizer generator the also below, below derivation. Uh, like there's uh, there's different ways of doing it, like. You cannot escape from the fact that you cannot just proof everything automatically. Yeah, but you can automate some parts of it. I believe they did uh, try to automatically generate proofs of equivalence. Uh, but like, uh, like in the basic application which I talked about, it's like you start with one optimization, then you do it by hand and you prove that it's equal, equal by hand and then it just learns the optimization about you coding it. Yes, sorry. Two questions. Uh, yeah. but one question and one comment. The question is, it seems to me that the, uh, like the majority of the work here is done when you pattern match against the nonlinear pattern. So you, know, you have 8 plus 8 minus 8 and by choosing you know, the two 8s on the right side to both be S, but the left hand side eight is just Q when you when you abstract it. Like that's yeah. that, that's something that makes this work, but uh, like how would you know You need you need to do some math for that. So <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I haven't done that. I mean like yeah. why you know, why not write it as S plus S minus Q? Yes, that's as in to explain that properly you need to go into more detail as to how you actually execute proof steps backwards. So like, I can do that after this, but like it will take some time and it's confusing, so. And the, the, the other thing I want to tell yeah. you that of course there are uh, arithmetic uh, systems or attributes where, which are solvable. Yes. So like if you only use Pressburger arithmetic, yeah. then of course you should be able to come up with all these proofs. You can do it automatically, automatically. yeah. Which is nice, but like, um, depends. Um, I mean, I don't think you will use Pressburger arithmetic only for your programs, so <laughs> yeah. But there's still, there's still manual effort involved, but it's a nice idea. Okay, so any more questions? Yeah, so um, let me try <laughs> and do some math, I guess. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure actually if I can like do all of this, but I'll try. So, um, so actually, um, the original formulation of the algorithm was using uh, category theory. If anybody knows what that is, but uh, so I'll just go through like a <laughs> super fast overview. Um, so if you have a category. A category is a collection of objects and arrows. So 
Um, for example, the easiest way to think of them are just as sets. Um, and the arrows between sets will be functions. Let's say functions f and g. And when you have the ar these arrows just need to obey a few rules. Firstly, every object has an identity arrow. Uh, you, you, can compose, you can compose any two arrows um, to form a third arrow. And the last one is that composition is an associative operation. Yeah. Um, so, what's I going to say? Yeah. Um, so the idea that they came up with was to uh, encode the axioms of your proof system uh, as arrows in a certain category, um, not in the usual sense. Um, but let's let's see. So uh, let's talk about the category of uh, binary relations. So uh, binary uh, binary relation R is a oops. A binary relation R is a subset of uh, tuples. Uh, it's, a, it's a subset of tuples, and you can we can express them like uh, x y y z. So we can write them like this. So I say x is related to y, and y is related to z. And uh, so let's say we want to encode like transitivity of this relation. Uh, then the transitivity axiom could uh, would be an arrow from x, y, y, z to x, z. Uh, oops. Uh, so what's I going to say? Um, so arrows in this category, uh, in this category of relations, are basically substitutions of the variables such that uh, every relation is preserved. So with x, r, y, then any substitution uh, sigma x uh, is also related to sigma of y, um, and so uh, the arrow here would just be the inclusion uh, from this relation to the other, and then let's say I let's say I have this other thing a b b c a c. A, A, something like this. Um, then uh, we can say that this, this relation is transitive because, uh, because there's an arrow from there's an arrow from this into this. Uh, it's F. The arrows F and G, such that uh, from the left hand side of the axiom to the original and the right hand side to this such that the whole diagram uh, commutes in the sense that uh, applying G after the transitivity axiom is equal to applying this straight. Yeah. And then uh, we would like to encode the, we would like to encode um, using axioms to derive more information about a certain thing which we didn't have before. So in, in, in this case, it would be uh, if you started with A, B, B, C, uh, A, A, for example, uh, then you would like to use transitivity. Let's say you know this relation is transitive. Then you would like to use transitivity to, to derive that A is related to C. Um, so the, uh, the way it works is that you take a push out of this arrow and this arrow, which I, will ex which I should have explained just now, but I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. So, let's, let's see where is this? Um, they call this they call this application. So, um, so we have. So, um, so just just to show that this works is that you can have uh, this arrow would be the inclusion of this set into this one. 
and this arrow would be the inclusion with the substitution of x going to a, y going to b, and z going to c. Um, so I need to explain what a, I probably need to explain what a push out is, and a push out is um, given uh, objects a, b, and c, and arrows f and g. A push out is the object d such that uh, for any for any other object. Any object E, there is an arrow uh, from D into there is a unique arrow from D into E. So the way to think about this uh, is to think of arrows um, as like saying if there's an arrow from A to B, that means B has all the information that is encoded in A. That's one way to think about it. So uh, this is saying or or B has some has the structure of A. So because these are usually structure preserving arrows. Um, so in this sense, like uh, if B has a structure of A and C has the structure of A, then the push out is the is the way we can glue both B and C together that contains the least amount of information without. So in in our case of Axiom application, um, we want to find the smallest possible relation that uh, that is transitive and has this structure as well. Yeah. So. Um, let's see. Mm. So. So this would be a single ap axiom application. And if we have a whole proof, it will be a series of axiom applications. So we will get a series of push-outs like this in this manner. So where they are all connected by this thing, by like this part over here. And, uh, and at the bottom, we will have our, at the bottom, we will have our full like concrete proof that we want to generalize. So, um, let's see. Um, let me do one more construction. So, uh, it's a, uh, it, it's so we we just now did a push out. Uh, we now talk about pullbacks, which are the like dual notion to push outs. So um, it's given two arrows here. Uh, we find an object uh, over here such that uh, for any object which goes into this, um, we have a unique arrow this way. Um, so push outs correspond to uh, gluing together these two things along the common part A. And pullbacks correspond to uh, identifying the common part A from B and C. Yeah. So, um, so, let's say we have, uh, how did they write it? If you have, so uh, let's look at generalizing a single proof step. So, uh, so this will be a single. This will be a single proof step. Um, we would like to generalize it by finding something, some objects here that look like this. So. Uh, in, because our axiom instantiates to our concrete proof, and but we want to find a general, more general one that instantiates into the concrete one, uh, but but it's also instantiated into by the axioms. So, um, one thing to note is that um, yes, if we are just talking about a single 
proves that the most general generalization is the axiom itself. Uh, but the reason this doesn't work when you have multiple proof steps is because the pushouts are, don't look like this. They are not connected in this way, but rather this thing is connected here. So um, in, in simpler terms, when you're doing a proof, your axioms don't always apply at the same part of the term. They can apply to different parts of the term. So simply just, uh, simply just uh, choosing the axiom isn't enough. Um, how am I supposed to do this? Okay. Uh, so for let's let's think about an example of optimization. So when we are optimizing something, uh, we want a proof of equivalence. So uh, we would like to point to something in the final object that we want to generalize. Uh, in this case, uh, for optimization, there, it will be an equivalence uh, that we want to generalize. Um, um, okay, let me digress <laughs> a little bit. So let's look at our proof again of 8 plus 8 minus 8 equals 8. So if we write it as like a AST kind of thing, so you initially have this, and then and then we use eight plus eight, eight minus eight equals zero. The way they represent this is uh, they add like an equality edge, which says that this subterm is equal to this subterm. So this subterm equals zero, and then uh, you apply one more you use the fact that 8 plus x plus y equals 0 equals to x. Uh, and you get, you get this kind of term. So this says that the whole tree is equal to this subterm over here. And so when I'm talking about, uh, like in the context of, uh, in the context of like this optimization thing, uh, a single property would be like an an edge in this diagram, an equality edge in this diagram. In this case, we would like to generalize this equality over here, which is the final equality that we derive. Um, so let's see. So. So um, it's a little, it's also a little bit mysterious to me sometimes. But like the way it's constructed is um, first you first you take the pullback of this of C and P, uh, which identify the common part of the property we want to generalize and the outcome of the last axiom. So this gives you some object O. Uh, then you glue together these two. Uh, you glue together C and P along the common part that you identified. So this gives you some G prime. And because of the push out property, uh, this has an arrow into E. Um, then we would like to find, uh, we would like to find some object here that it's like the equivalent of this thing, but for the original left-hand side of the axiom. So uh, the way they do this is that they actually define a new categorical construction. Um, and then they just say that um, if this categorical construction exists, then you can do this generalization using their method. Uh, so they they call this uh, push out completion. Um, it's a bit weird, but so given 
given f and g, uh, the push-out completion of this is an object uh, d such that uh, oops. It's, a, it's an object D such that this whole thing is a push out and furthermore for any other push out um, that for any other push out that uh, factors through G um, there is an arrow going from here into here which is what which is what it's trying to say is that um, you take um, hold on. <laughs> so, so this this object here happens to be uh, the contents of C minus uh, minus B and plus A. So that's a bit weird. So. Let me try and talk about sets, for example. So if you had a set uh, A, maybe this was X, Y, Z. And then, uh, so there's an arrow into this set. And let's say we had um, X, Y, Z, W. D. Let's say we had these two arrows. Then uh, the then the push out completion would actually be um, X Y. Z, D. Um, so it's like from here to here, by applying this rule, we added another W. And uh, in our instantiation, there was another D added as well. Uh, so we undid the application of adding the extra W, but we still kept the application of the D. And because of having this arrow inside, uh, from D to E prime, you ensure that this is the smallest possible object that has these properties. So in a way, this, this construction basically encapsulates what it means to apply axiom backwards, to undo the effect of axiom. And so they just apply it to this part over here to get your generalization. Yeah. Um, and so now once you have this, um, you can chain multiple of these things together and you can derive a generalized proof of the whole thing. So we, can, we should actually look at a single example, like using this example over here. So, um, Let's see. So our concrete optimization was of the following steps. So we started with this. We applied the axiom uh, x minus x goes to 0. So this is our axiom. I'll just label this. H just for just for clarity. Um, so and then um, we applied the second axiom, uh, which was um, x plus y equals to zero. Circle. Um, If x plus y, and if y equals to zero, then uh, the whole thing is equal to x. Let's put this in a circle. So um, they call these kind of expressions uh, extended program expression 
graphs or something like that. Um, so they showed that these things actually form a category with all the necessary constructions. Um, uh, so, and the axioms allow you to take pushouts and pullbacks and whatever. Zero. Okay, so now we identify this edge which we want to generalize, which is this one, the one which says the whole thing is equal to eight. And this gives, so a single edge is, we can point it out in this thing by this uh, AST with some variable P equal to Q. So this is like just saying P equals to Q and then it's pointing out this edge in the whole thing where P is the 8 and Q is the rest of it. Um, when we take the pullback, um, taking the pullback means uh, finding the common part between this thing and this thing, which happens to be the pretty much the same thing. It's also uh, P to Q, but I'll just rename them. So when we take the push out, we join these two on the common part. We join this, this thing and this thing along the common part, uh, which basically gives you the same thing. Uh, because as I said, like, um, when you only have one axiom, the most general generalization is the axiom itself. So it shouldn't be surprising that we are actually just getting the same thing as the axiom here. So um, we call this. Uh, a plus B zero. Um, just to be clear, like arrows in this category are substitutions uh, and making one thing a subtree of the other. So here we substituted X with A, Y with Y with B, and here we substituted P with A and Q with B equals zero, yeah. And so likewise taking the poop taking the taking the push out completion gives you the same thing. Um, it's undoing the effect of the application and with this representation, undoing the axiom of the effect of the axiom is usually quite simple because it's usually just remove all the things that were created by that axiom step. So This simply becomes this. Uh, so now we repeat the process one more time. This one is slightly more interesting. Um, so we have this this object and this object. Uh, we glue it. We we glue it together over the common part, which happens, which is this equality edge that we are now generalizing. Um, I'm sorry, we are. When we take the pullback, we are not gluing it together. We are identifying the equality edge. We are identifying the common part. So that will be some uh, R equals to S. And when we, when we take the push out, uh, we glue, this to, glue these two things together along this edge. So we, we match this edge with this edge. And then we see that you have to substitute this x with some b minus b so that this subterm becomes the same as, uh, I'm sorry, you have to substitute y with this part over here so that you can fit the tree, you can glue the tree together along this edge. So you will get, oh, this should be, this should be a and b, not x and y. Yes. Uh, so you get something like a plus C C goes to zero, and finally the the push out completion just removes this equality edge, and then you get a plus. Yeah, okay. So then this is a generalized form of this, and to obtain an actual proof, you have to like this isn't exactly quite a proof because there's no arrow from here into here directly, but you need to replace, you need to like undo. 
like you need to substitute all the correct things in for the variables here. For example, when going from here to here, we substituted uh, C minus C for B. So if you, so you have to substitute that back inside here, and then you repeat that. You just cascade all the substitutions, and then you get a generalized proof. Yeah. So that's the that's how it works. I don't know, but it's kind of nice to me. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, I just think that this was uh, quite an interesting... The interesting thing was that uh, like category theory is normally this very abstract thing that nobody really cares about anyway. So, um, but it was quite surprising that people actually... Uh, con that they actually conceive of this algorithm using such an abstract foundation because uh, according to them, uh, thinking in this manner clarified a lot of the weird hand-waving things that you would do when you were thinking about different pr certain instances of proof systems. Yeah, okay, so that's all. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Any questions? Maybe. Yeah. Sorry, it's going to be applied to supercompilation, but that, that doesn't give you any proof, right? It just gives you a... No, as in the idea would be uh, uh, so the way they did it is that they were able to automatically generate some proofs of equivalence. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they could use th you could they could use these results for that. Yeah. Um, I think you mentioned that the um, the this is only available for um, for I think categories and uh, like errors where you can construct like uh, push hard completion. Is that right? So does that limit oh. the? Technically, it does. So. Uh, you need to have, uh, you need to have. Firstly, your category needs to have a way of uh, instantiating axi encoding axioms. Uh, you need to be able to take push outs with the axioms. You can, you must do pullbacks, and you must have this uh, push out completion thing. Um, so yes, like technically, this will limit the kind of maybe axioms that you will be able to work with. But they, according to them, they said that. All of the common axioms they tried, like distributivity, oh, so no, on and so forth, were able to, yeah. they were able to encode it. I was wondering about the programming language actually. Like, is the pro is there is there like does that limit the like the features of the programming language that you're like uses? Does it only look like referentially mm -hmm. transparent like programming languages? Or, like, mm -hmm. Maybe, but I mean, they seem to be working on some C like. They seem to be working with C or at least a fra a fragment of C. Yeah, so I would say like it works with at least most of the common cases. Yeah. Uh, do, you, sorry. The guy? Uh, okay. do you have any experience in like uh, abstract interpretation? Uh, actually, I've been I know some things uh, because I've been reading up, but I can't say I've actually like done stuff. <laughs> yeah. This kind of reminds me of that, like it's it's about finding a middle, like uh, lattice between the concrete and the abstract. The, um, uh, I'm not very familiar with that, but okay. um, I can't really say whether there's a connection here. Yeah, sorry. So in in a in a classic optimization problem, you want to not prove that the optimized program is equivalent, but first you need to find the optimized program. So yes. how does this work in this setting? Because here everything we've seen is about proving that yes, it's a valid transformation, but uh, does this give any any tool to finding the transformed uh, I don't, this thing doesn't give you a way to do that. Uh, I think the up sh the upshot is that uh, the upshot is mainly in the ability to say for for the programmer to be able to say that um, for the programmer to be able to say that this thing sh this thing should be faster than this one and these two are equivalent. So can you can the compiler please figure out the optimization for this? So it's not really finding what the optimized version is. Uh, that wasn't really the goal of the paper. Yeah, 
And I think more generally, this idea of finding a um, most general generalization is interesting in itself because it's telling you that it's it's t showing you a way to strip away all the unessential parts and only leaving the most important things. Yeah, something like that. But then, yeah. <coughs> if, if, you, if the programmer starts with a program and the optimized program proves the equivalence, why not write the optimized program? Uh, because uh, you want your compiler to optimize programs for you. So if you can teach it the optimization, then it can apply it to every program that you want. Because writing optimized programs directly is annoying. Some, so you want the compiler to do it for you. Yeah. So can I just clarify, it takes the thing in the middle and... Yeah, this is the generalized version, yeah. And it's equivalent, uh, it's, I mean, the, the programs that, are, that you use to... Uh, that you use to yes. To yes, they prove, they prove that um, if your proof system is sound and it has all these constructions, then uh, this middle thing is also a valid uh, also a valid uh, transformation. Um, so some things to note is like there's nothing being said about whether this thing runs faster than this thing. Uh, that's kind of assume that you will only t teach it optimizations that are actually faster than the original one. Uh, so, and also another thing is that when I say most general generalization it is actually uh, relative to the axioms that you give it. So, for example, I could actually replace, um, like, let's say, uh, Maybe, maybe not in this case, but um, in some cases, maybe you could talk about if you use like associativity uh, of maybe plus, instead of using plus, maybe it could be replaced with any operation that is associative. So it depends, also depends on how general your axioms are. Yeah. But given the axioms, this is the most general generalization. Yeah. Yeah. Does, uh, do you, you do your point about um, like assuming that you only teach it um, axioms that optimize the program? Like if you edit the optimized program first and like the original program afterwards, could it theoretically like learn how to like obfuscate your program or like you know like cause a performance uh, slowdown? Sure. Like, yeah, it will. It, it, it will work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. It'll be, it'll be kind of funny, though. <laughs> yeah. I'm just curious, is the instance of the programs actually necessary? Because you have the proof already, right? Could you generate the instance from the proof? Um, the, the, the one at the bottom. From Do the you proof. actually need this as input? I mean, if you had the proof, if you have the whole proof, then I suppose that you could. But the idea is that um, you are given the instances and then you have to find a proof for it. Yeah, something like that. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm missing something because that does sound a bit strange. So, yeah. What's the practical reason why it's not more commonly used? Uh, I, I assume that may maybe... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, this is because yes, this is kind of a this is kind of an old paper. I didn't. It's two thousand and ten, I think. Uh, so presumably that's something which makes it like not very useful. I assume it's encoding all these axioms is very tedious, and finding a proof is difficult. So that's the problem that I would imagine here. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Okay. Any last questions? Alright. Okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>